we are going to continue in our Holy Spirit series. Somebody say the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Who feels that you are that you are not just having more knowledge of the Spirit, but you're drawing closer to the Holy Spirit over the last month. Now, some of you be like, Pastor, it's not because your message. I've always been close to the Holy Spirit. That's fine, but I want to let you know I'm drawing closer to the Holy Spirit by preaching the message because I believe every time we preach the gospel that God will heighten something or highlight something that will be helpful to us no longer how long we've been in the faith. Do you agree with that this morning? And this is one of those messages that we have to be careful on for probably many of us in the room because we'll be very quick to say, I could go there and I could preach that, right? So today I'm going to unpack it. I'm going to do the best that I can, be faithful to what the Lord has given me. I was telling the Holy Spirit this morning in worship, I want to be faithful to the text, faithful to what you've given me, faithful to what you've given me that I've downloaded in notes and faithful for the revelation that you would give me as I preach it. So who's ready to hear the word of the Lord this morning? Galatians 5, 24 through 26. Galatians 5, chap, verses 24 through 26. And those who are Christ's, right? Sometimes I like to stop and I like to say, okay, Lord, you're getting ready to show me if I'm in you or not in you. For those who are Christ's, watch this, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Who would shout, I still need a little bit of work, but I'm working through crucifying the flesh. Anybody by a show of hands, from last Sunday to this Sunday, had to crucify the flesh at least once. How many of you wish that thing, that that flesh would just stay on the cross, crucified, but, but it doesn't. So we've crucified, if we're in Christ, the flesh with its passions and desires. Fleshly living has both passions and desires. You're passionate about your fleshly desires, your sinful desires. That, that's, there's nothing hidden in that. If we live in the Spirit, let us also what? Walk in the Spirit. Let us not become, so this is what those who are in Christ it, it, this should look like in your life. You should not be conceited. Amen, church? You should not be provoking one another. There's not, a, there's not a spirit of provoke on you. That's not the Holy Spirit. It says also you should not be envying one another. When you see that God is blessing someone in their life, uh, in their home, in whatever that looks like, in their gifting, How many of you know we should be thankful and like, God, thank you. I'm going to amplify that. Thank you, Lord, that you're moving upon their life and you're blessing them in such a way. But we're not to be envious. We're not look to look to somebody else and try to one up it or try to be better. No, we're just, we're we're not to do that. So we're not, we're not here to be conceited. We're not here to provoke one another. We're not here to envy one another. We are here to walk in the spirit I'm not going to try to break down these Greek words because, to be quite honest with you, the easiest way for me to do that would be to bring up the audio and play it, and and I'm just not going to take the time to do that because I will butcher them, but I want to let you know what the Greek word means, to walk in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit, the Greek rendering of this word means to walk in line with And I want to bring some perspective today that I truly believe is from the Holy Spirit. As I asked him, what would be the best way for me to model this, to walk in the Spirit? That word walk means to proceed in a row like a trained marching soldier. Does that give you some perspective? Who's ever seen our military walk in in line and cadence? And they spin the right way and turn the right way. Matter of fact, if you've looked at different countries, who have seen that different countries march different than our soldiers? There's different ways and, and ways in which they're trained. But to walk in the spirit means to walk in line with. It means to proceed in a row as a marching soldier. Who would consider yourself a soldier in the army of Jesus Christ? today, right? And that means that you don't want to be inadequately trained. I will say this, the Bible will never inadequately train you, but men and women can inadequately train you. 
Are you, are you capturing that this morning? So I wanna do the best that I can to show this because I believe we often get this perspective as church folk, as saints of God. I'm gonna just kind of walk in the spirit. Lord, I'm gonna walk in the spirit. I'm gonna walk in this thing. And, and what we do in that is we begin to walk and we begin to step. Lord, I just wanna be, we've heard this, I wanna be led by the spirit. I wanna walk in the spirit. What I found sometimes is we'll be walking and we'll get out right way out here and we'll start praying for the Lord to bless us. But we might already be 20 steps ahead of the Lord. Are you following me? So I'm walking and I'm led by the Spirit and I'm walking in the Spirit. I'm not being sarcastic on this, but I think sometimes we get way out here in front of God and then we say, Lord, can you please bless what I'm doing instead of walking in what he said he would bless? Capture that today. So here's what I wanna do. I I wanna do my best to, I borrowed some of the kids supplies today if that's all right. I'm just going to use these colored dots here to illustrate a point, if that's okay. And we'll just leave them on stage for a little bit. To walk in the Spirit as a trained soldier means that the Spirit already has a path for us. Notice that I didn't say you. We've got to stop doing this as churches that the Lord wants this church to walk a particular way and this church to walk. Well, we have to understand he's only got one church and that's his church. And he's called every church to walk the same, the same pattern in something that's already been laid out. So if I look at these colored dots, it's already a pattern for what the Holy Spirit is telling me to walk in. Right, so, so I just look at the, the next mark of what the Holy Spirit has already mapped out. I'm not getting way out there and saying, Lord, bless me over here. I'm like, I'm walking in your blessing because this is where the Lord told me to step. This church is good at, at memorizing and quoting scripture. Uh, the, the Bible says that a, a righteous man's steps are what? By the Lord. Ordered. Ordered. So you're not out just doing your own thing, step in. They are ordered by the Lord. Hey, Brian, step here. Who's ever begun to step in a direction that you know the Holy Spirit was like, eh, back up. They are ordered by the Lord. They are patterned by the Lord. Like a trained soldier, God, I'm waking up on Monday and I'm thankful that, that there is a righteousness that I've been called to walk in. Okay, so we'll get back to these steps here in just a couple moments, but I want to be able to segregate this thought. It is not just this willy-nilly, I'm just going to walk in the Spirit, I'm going to be led by the Spirit. It's led by what He has already trained us and taught us and showed us, right? So give me some time this morning and we'll, we'll get through this clear path that the Holy Spirit has laid out for the trained soldier. Somebody shout trained. Sometimes that sounds really good. If you've ever seen like a, 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 a Marine all decked out in their, their dress blues or whatever that outfit is and they're wearing it, it's like, man, that dude looks sharp. Well, that's what you are in Christ. You're trained. You're equipped to do what Christ has called you to do. There, there is a step that he has called you to walk in. Those steps are ordered by the Lord. So we're going to talk today in the series on the Holy Spirit uh, on this topic, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. You can write that down in your notes if, you're, if you choose to do so. I want to make sure that I say this in the right way because... We are teaching the fullness of the Spirit, not just a piece of the Holy Spirit. And I I feel that I've been disciplined to do that, and I've submitted myself to the Holy Spirit and to the Lord to say, how do you want to break this down? So we've just been walking through Scripture. I think sometimes we're too quick in the church to go to the noticeable thing, and that's the gift. I, I could put position it this way, the fire, Right? You're driving down the road, and you're driving down 21, and all of a sudden you see a bunch of smoke, and you see flames shooting out of a property or out of a house, and and you pull off to the side of the road to look at it because there's something powerful about it. You don't necessarily like in that scenario what's happened, 
but you're attracted to it. You're driving down an orchard, uh, see an orchard on 55. Not mo- most people aren't pulling off the side of the highway to, to point out apples to their kids. We're very attracted to the gifts. And sometimes we're very envious of the gifts. And sometimes we take a gift that the Lord has given us, and if we're not careful, we can provoke another person to be spiritually unhealthy. And I just want to say it this way. If you have a gift from the Lord, he gave it to you. You didn't earn it. You weren't good enough or gifted enough or bright enough. And all of a sudden, I I really saw that you were doing something and making something of yourself. So I thought I would give you a gift. No, the gifts of the Lord come from the Lord. Who's thankful for that? But I want us for this week not to think about the gifting even in this local church. I want us to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Not the gifts of the Spirit. We will get there. But I want to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. The, the fruit, we are, we are more apt to focus on the power of the gifts other than to really walk in let's just put it this way. Lord, I want to be gifted. I'm praying to be gifted. I'm praying that you give me a gift. But when it comes to the fruit, we can be, if we're not careful, more of a take it or leave it type people. Here's the problem with that. You can't be filled with the Holy Spirit if you don't have the fruit of the Spirit. That, that will be the antithesis or the end all of this message. We got to stop claiming to be filled with the Holy Spirit if we don't have the fruit in our life because it's impossible to be filled with the Spirit without the fruit of the Spirit. You could be loud, you could be boisterous, you could say, God's using me in this way, God, okay, that's a gift, that's fine. But if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the gift, you have the fruit of the Spirit to back the gift that the Lord's given you. Amen? So Galatians 5, 22 through 23 breaks all of this down for us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what else? And self-control against such there is no law. So I don't want us to think, I I want us to, to, to move out of the weeds of gift right now. It is important and we'll talk about it, but I want us to think about fruit in our lives. And I want us to really look at, I think if you go to Ephesians 5, I or Galatians 5, I think it's 19, it's going to talk, watch this, about the works, everybody hear that? Works of the flesh. There's an S on that speaking to the plurality. Who has had some works of the flesh in your life that were beyond just one single thing? Your flesh working in contrast to your spirit, really even working against you because there are many works of the flesh. And in Galatians 5, 19, Somebody can check that reference. I think that's right. It's right, Joey. It's right around there. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to list the works of the flesh. So if you read through the works of the flesh, you can't dodge them. They're pretty right there in your face. So if you want to know if you have works of the flesh living in you, read Galatians 5.19, and Scripture will show you that. But when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, and some will use this interchangeably, and I, and I understand it, and I'm not going to call it a big theological error, but Scripture does not call them the fruits of the Spirit. It is called the what? The fruit of the Spirit. And as we walk through this, I want to, I want to show you why Scripture lays it out. That's, who knows when God has a plan, it's a really good plan, so we don't need to add an S to what he didn't put an S to. Right? So it's not about the fruits of the Spirit. It's about the fruit of the Spirit against such there is no law, that we need to be walking in it. I want to talk, now there are nine of them. I'm doing a nine-point message. So there are nine of them, and I'm going to move through these as quickly as I can and still make sense of this. The fruit of love. This love that is used, and I'm not going to break down every word, but this love that is used is the agape love, and it's an affection or a benevolence type love. Who's ever seen a brother in Christ going through something, and the love in your heart said, you know what, I I have to do something. 
I, there, there's a brotherly love that is shown in this. There is a benevolent love. There is an affectionate love that is shown because here's a brother or sister in Christ going through something. Romans 5, 5 talks about this. Now, hope does not disappoint. And God's church shouted amen. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us because the love of God, the love of God is living in us, is working in us. So when you see someone that is disappointed, and, and let me say this, when you see somebody that is disappointed, the goal is not to say, hey, I'm going to see if we can have a conversation so that I can lift you out of your disappointment. And some people try to do that. They might take, take I mean, think, think about this, standing in a casket, people are walking by and you're standing there and you've lost a significant person in your life. How many of us have not said, but they're in a better place? So what we try to do is, is kind of shift the disappointment. That's not what godly love is. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with saying it. Here's what I'm saying. You are not to try to lift their disappointment. You're bringing ointment to the disappointment. You say, I'm just praying God's hope in this situation. And we'll see what the Lord begins to do out of the fruit of love. I want to talk a little bit about the fruit of joy. Somebody shout joy. This Greek word that is used here, we, we sang this as kids. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Do you remember that? I'll tell you what, if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on a tack. Do you remember that? Down in my heart, down in my heart. I got the joy of the Lord. But what does it mean? Because we see like this joy thing, and I had joy one day, and I didn't have joy another day, and I was joyful one day, but I'm not joyful on Thursday because I just got a bad report. Well, if you have the fruit of the Spirit living in you because you've been filled with the Spirit, you can have joy in the midst of great turmoil, grief, and pain. So the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Joy, it means cheerfulness. The Greek word means a calm delight. You ever just been around somebody that was calm? How many of you know people that just get worked up over anything? They can, make, they can turn anything into drama. Little bit, I mean, just dramatize it. Who's ever seen somebody in just a very difficult situation just bring a calmness to it? Okay. Don't know exactly what to do right now, but I'll, I know what we could do. We could trust the Lord in this situation, and they just radiate this joy. It, the, joy the fruit of joy is the, is the, uh, the fruit of gladness. And as I was thinking through this, the Lord of all passages brought me to a Christmas passage in the Bible. Now, remember, we're the ones that called it a Christmas passage. But it stuck, stuck out to me as I looked at Matthew chapter 2, 9 through 10. When they had heard the king, they departed. Behold, the star which had, they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. So they had been guided by the Holy Spirit. It's standing over where this child was. And there's a song about it. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Are you thankful that we kind of have a star over the manger every day? Yeah. Like we know that these, these wise men found him and scripture notates it. But every day in your life, regardless of what you're walking through, there is a star over the manger that is pointing you in the direction of God, that there is a joy living in you. There's another old hymn says that there is joy unspeakable and full of glory. The Psalm said it. Why is, why is my face downcast, Lord? Sure, I'm walking through something, and, sh and sure, it's difficult, and sure, it's painful, and sure, I don't like it. These are all things the flesh shouldn't. I, I don't like it when I'm walking through stuff, but I can have the exceeding joy of the Lord in the moment that I'm walking through. Why? Because I have the fruit of the Spirit. Who's thankful for the joy of the Lord? <clears throat> I want to talk about the fruit. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. I want to talk about the fruit of peace. And this word peace means a place of rest and contentment. How long has it been? Think through this for a minute. Just a quick exercise. How long has it been since you've been able to just go ahead and sit out on the deck, sit down on your screen and porch, sit by the pool, Whatever it looks like for you. 
sit in the park and just say, Lord, I am completely at rest and I am completely at a space in my life of contentment. Not sitting there thinking, how do I make more? We've got this need in our life. How are we gonna figure that out? We've got this project that needs to be done. Our kids this, our kids that. How long has it been since you've sat with the fruit of peace and just said, Lord, I am completely at rest and completely content. I don't need another thing. I don't have to be chasing another thing. I am rested in you and I'm content in you. Paul says that in Philippians. He says that he had this, reached this space. I've just learned there's gonna be ups and downs. There's gonna be hills and valleys. I've just learned to be in a place. I'm just gonna be content in who the Lord is in my life. There might be people sitting in this room that say, I don't really remember. Because every time I sit down in that quiet, restful place, all of these arrows bombard me of what I need to be doing. I need to this, and I need to organize that. I got to this, and I got to that. It's all back to I have to, other than say, Lord, the fruit of peace in my life. I am rested in you, and I am content in you. Isaiah 26, the Old Testament passage, Isaiah 26, three verses, verses one through three. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city, God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks, open the gates, that the righteous nation, watch this, that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. You will, this is where we pull that scripture from. You will keep him in perfect peace. If you want perfect peace in your life, the answer is coming. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Why? Because he trusts in you. And this sounds so easy because we throw this word trust around like we do love. We love everything. We love pizza. We love our cat. We love our house. We love the new area rug that we bought for the living room. We love, we love, we love, we love, we trust, we trust, we trust, we trust. But put it, put it through this, put it through the trust test. That Lord, you're going to keep my mind, you're going to keep me in perfect peace when I stay my mind on you. Just anybody, any, anybody kind of track the storm this week, hurricanes that are moving through, and you've got, we've, we've had some people, some uh, family that were actually over there, and they kind of had to, you know, things were getting boarded up, and they were eating and all that, and said, hey, we're good, but water had come into the hotel and all these things. In the middle of calamity, in the middle of the great storms of life, I want to ask Vital Church something. Can I still have the fruit of peace? Are you sure that the Lord doesn't take that portion of it and say, hey, put that on the shelf right now. You're walking through something really difficult. Is that what the Lord does? Dices up pieces of the fruit? No, he says you can have the fruit of peace, a fruit of rest and a fruit of contentment. That word peace, that Greek word peace means this, if you're interested. It means a state of order between God and man. Lord, here's why I can remain in perfect peace right now. Because the state of order between you and me is good. Isn't that a good spot to be in? You, you say, but I have wayward children, Pastor. Lord, this is why I could remain in perfect peace. Because every man has to figure this out and every woman for themselves, and I can't answer for them. But Lord, between you and me, things are in order. But this happened and that happened and, and, and this and that. We were traveling a couple weeks ago and we were driving through an area, obviously, that had been hit with a, a pretty heavy tornado. Houses ripped in half, roofs off a building. There was one major distribution center they were ripping down. You could still see the contents inside, all this stuff on skids and stacked up 25, 30 foot high. 
And, and you look at that, and I can remember when the storms were coming through and there was some media out there. How do we, how do we remain in a place of peace in those times? Here's, here's the way, the Greek word. God, the order between you and me is right. The hymn writer put it this way. It is well with my soul. It's, it's intriguing to me in my, in my 51-year-old mind because you, you start seeing things as you grow up. You, you kind of mature into your faith. And that was easy to repeat as a kid because you heard your parents say, I trust in God. But then who knows as an adult, you're going to have to walk through some stuff where you put that thing to the test. You've heard me say it before. It was more than a little flannel graph that they put up for a moment or the little sing cards that you made. That was to begin to shore up. Hey, I see my parents walking in the ways of Christ, but everybody's going to have to put it to the test because you go through something and all of a sudden you go through a storm and you could see that there's peace in the center of it because the order between God and man, God and woman is right. Let's look at another fruit. I want to talk about the fruit of long suffering. And I believe that we have to look at this from two separate angles, at least in my study of the text from the original word in Greek. I think we have to look at this two ways. And, and, and I believe that my faith is growing at, a, at another level in this. And it's not easy, but it's true. We look often as long suffering is I have to kind of have this patience. Well, let me, let me say, who's ever raised kids? Or who's ever had your niece or nephew over? Who's ever babysat for a day? And, and all of a sudden, parents come to pick them up, mom and dad come to pick them up, Gr grandma and grandpa come to take them for a week, and you're like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I have had to be so long-suffering with them. I, to suffer long. I'm thankful that grandma and grandpa get them for a week. Can you take them for two? Because I got them all the time. I mean, but what can they eat? Feed them anything. It doesn't matter. Feed them ice cream all they want. You keep them for two weeks, make it convenient. Because I've suffered so long. It's a piece of it to be long-suffering. I don't want to make light of it because sometimes we have family members or people in our life where we've had to practice long suffering with because watch this we apply it to their situation we pray them through we fast through it because I have suffered long with them that we forget that there's going to be areas in our life where we have to suffer long through something the thorn doesn't come out of the flesh the burden doesn't lift it's been two years, three years. You've talked to everybody in the church. You need to fast more, pray more, memorize this scripture, put this over your door frame. You've done everything. You're living for God. There's not an area of your life that's like just out there. You're like, here's where I'm at, Lord. And you're suffering long through something. This isn't just you suffering long for others. This is you being long suffering with yourself when you're walking through things and continuing to bring it up to the Lord saying, Lord, I thank you that you're my deliverer today. I thank you that you're my help today. James chapter 5, 9 through 11 says, do not grumble against one another. It's, it's interesting that the Holy Spirit had to, had to inspire man to write this, yet it's here. Like, we should know this. Do not grumble against one another Heathen, no. Do not grumble against one another, ye that are far from the Lord, no. Do not grumble against one another, brethren. Some of you are like, I would never grumble or be upset with my brother in the Lord. Can I say this in a very loving way? Give it time, my brother. <laughs> and, and I'm going to say give it time because I'll mess it up. Give it time because you'll mess it up. There will be a burr under your saddle. There'll be something that rubs you wrong. And all of a sudden, you're smiling on the driveway, in the driveway. 
And on the way home, there's this trigger that they this and they that, if they only knew. Do not grumble against one another, brother, unless you be condemned. We don't like that. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets. So he says, go back to the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. They spoke as an example of suffering and patience. There are a lot of people that want to be prophetic and prophet and title today. I don't know if a lot of people walking around the New Testament were like, just make me a prophet, make me a prophet, make me a prophet, because prophets weren't liked. This is the way of the Lord walk in it. You don't do this, God says this is gonna happen. Well, isn't there an in-between? Can't I just kind of do, well, scripture says this is gonna happen, right? Prophets weren't most of the time treated well. They spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. They were an example of suffering and patience, but they still spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and very merciful. Lord, why do I have to suffer the way that I suffer? Through many years of studying the word of God, through many years of talking to many men and women who have studied the word of God, through several years of talking to a handful of people in my life, I classify as modern day theologians, I have arrived at this and from studying the word itself. Why do I have to suffer so long? I've learned as a pastor that this is my greatest theological response. I don't know. I don't know. We have two individuals um, in our church that lost very significant people this week. I don't know why. I, I, I don't know why when you're going through your normal pattern in life and all of a sudden somebody's just snuffed out, I don't know why. I, I don't know why there's people in our life that we love and that we care about and we pray and we pray and we pray and we do everything that we know to do and cancer removes them from this planet. Men and women who trusted in God, bulwarks of the faith. I don't know. But I do know this, that the Lord can give us the capacity to walk with the fruit of the Spirit in those unknowns. That the Lord would help us eat the fruit as we're long-suffering through things others are going through and things that we're going through. I want to talk about the fruit of kindness. And some people feel like they live with this fruit because they're nice. That's not what it means. It, it doesn't mean, it kind of doesn't mean you're nice and cordial to someone. Because it's fairly easy sometimes to be nice and cordial and diplomatic. Like, because a lot of times if you don't, your wife will throw an elbow and say, you could have handled that way different. Right? But this fruit of kindness means that there's a gentleness about you. Man, this is, the, this is a big prayer I pray over myself. And I don't know, I, I love that scripture that David encouraged himself in the Lord. I actually use that. So there, there are times that I'm praying for you and there are times that I'm praying for me. And this is one thing that I pray over my life consistently. Lord, Give me the fruit of kindness operating in its Greek word, gentleness, when people are walking through stuff. I don't have to amplify it. I don't have to go talk about it. I don't have to let you know, especially if they've come to you or me in confidence. I don't have to dramatize it or traumatize it. I'm just letting you know that I'm here for you I will pray for you 
Call me at two in the morning. Call me at three. Call me whenever you need to. To show gentleness. Right? Some of us might struggle with that because we never had gentleness maybe modeled to us by either parent growing up. I know sometimes we often put it on, on our wives or, or the female in the family that they could be so gentle with kids, like when they wipe out on their bicycle, what a mother will do, what a dad will do. But that's not always the case either, because I see some pretty diehard moms sometimes. Just go to a sporting event. Like the, their son's limping off the field, he can't hardly move, and all of a sudden you see the mom walking over the dugout. You all right? Oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to get back out there. I can't. You think anything's broken? No, I don't think anything's broken. Well, just go ahead, and get your glove on, get back out when coach calls you. Well, I think I'm going to just go tell him I can't play. You're not going to tell him you can't play. You're going to get back in the game. <laughs> I've seen Joy say it. I don't know. I, I, I cannot count the time she said it. We're kitchens. We do hard things. I don't feel like it. We do hard things. Right? More importantly, if you put that on the life of a believer, Lord, you told us they were going to do all this stuff to you. And then you also prefaced it and said, since they did this to me, you're also going to benefit from some of this. And all of a sudden we're walking through something and, and, and kindness. Who has ever just struggled to be kind? We don't have any unkind people here at, at Vital Church. This is amazing. Who has ever had to walk in your kid's room and humble yourself? Not a slice of pie. You had to eat the whole pie. And you say, I got to be honest with you. I, I haven't been gentle. Sometimes, this is where it will manifest sometimes. Sometimes it will be an error of what a parent walked through, and they're just like, hey, I just don't, I just don't want you to have to walk the same road. Here's the deal. Can we just say I'm sorry and I messed up and that be the end? Yeah. I handled it wrong. I, I wasn't kind. I wasn't gentle. In a Christian home, that wasn't the fruit of the spirit that the Lord would have me walk in. I'm not, I'm not saying that there's not a time to be tough. I'm saying be led by the spirit. If the spirit's saying tough, say, Lord, you're going you're to have to really show me how tough and you're going to have to help me guard my words because there's a lot of stuff that I want to say. But if you're leading me into having this conversation with my child, let's go. Everybody getting that this morning? Titus 3, 4 through 6 speaks to this word kindness or gentleness. But when the kindness and the love of our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. I, I got to stop right there at that comma. I am so thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ has been kind to me. I can't speak to you. I know me. And I'm so thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ has been kind to me. According to his mercy, he saved me through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Let's talk about the fruit of goodness. I'm actually moving through these pretty quickly. Some of you were really struggling when you heard that I was going to do a nine-point message, and I can only pray that you will have the fruit of the Spirit over the next couple moments. I want to talk about the fruit of goodness. Um, I was talking to someone the other day, and I, I'm not going to say who it was, but I was talking to someone the other day, and they just looked at me and said, He's a good man. You ever been talking to somebody before? And they say, I, I could tell you this, he's a good man. There's just something about that in today's, like, okay, check this out. Like, you, you've got, give me a line of work. Like, you've got to go have something serviced. It might be a what? 
carpentry, right? So let's say you have to have a deck put on your house, built onto your house, right? Like you don't want me building a deck on your house, I promise you. I'll labor, I'll help, um, but you don't want me to oversee that project. But when you have three or four people that somebody recommends, and out of the three, let's say it's the last one, you could say, I remember, I mean, it's been, I don't know, what, what was it, maybe 17 years ago? He, he put a deck, I'll, I'll tell you what, I could tell you this, he got a good business, but more importantly, he's a good man. How many of you might say, I'm giving that guy a call? Okay, so he was X amount of $100 more, but, but give me, give me a good man, not the goodness of ourself, but the fruit of goodness, goodness means uprightness of heart. We don't use the word a lot anymore, but it's a virtuous, we, we say this many times with women, a virtuous woman. How many, how many of you know God's also called men to be virtuous? Good men, Romans 15, 14. Now, I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness. Who's thankful that we have some men in this church that are good men? Who's thankful that we have some men in this church that are filled with God's goodness? Yeah. I'm thankful for that today. And I, I know there are women too. I'm not, I'm not downing that, but filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. And, and I love this when it comes to the fruit of goodness because sometimes men and women alike like to sit around and talk about all the goodness that they have done, all the things that they have done, but it's awesome when somebody defers to another and says, hey, what, talk to us about what you've been working. What, what have you been doing? What have you been doing? What's happening in your life right now, right? Admonishing another brother or sister in the Lord, the fruit of goodness. Let's talk about the fruit of faithfulness faithfulness. I, I want to give this a moment because faithfulness is a conviction of truth, but not just a conviction because some have a conviction and they live convicted. So there's a conviction that I'm not doing what I need to be doing. That's a type of conviction, but that's not what this faithfulness is talking about. This is a conviction of truth and a reliability within that conviction. Not, hey, I know what we need to be doing, but we're not. No, this is the way we're going to walk. We are walking this way. A conviction is a reliability to live in the parameters of the conviction. So you had a conviction to do the right thing, or you were convicted because you walked outside of what you knew to do. I'm going to preach this this morning. The church has got to see a resurgence of this fruit in it for us to move forward. Just faithful people. Faithful people. I was talking to my mom this morning. My, my parents have modeled this to us. My parents, we, we know that they're imperfect, but I'm gonna use something that's been modeled to me. My dad hasn't been feeling well over the last couple of days. I, asked, I reached out and I asked mom yesterday, is he gonna be able to preach? And um, I'll get in trouble for saying this, but they'll be fine. Um, uh, I called last night. He, said, he was just feeling like he wanted to get Chinese. So we went out and got Chinese. I'm like, all right, um, do, is, do, you need, do you need help tomorrow? He's like, no, we got, we got backup. Well, my mom was the backup, which I figured. So she sent me a text this morning and just said, hey, pray for dad. It's not feeling good, but I'm on my way to DeSoto. Faithful. Just faithful. I can't tell you how many times dad was laying on the couch, mom was covering something up here on Sunday because one parent didn't change the other parent's faithfulness. Can I preach this morning? I can't tell you how many times growing up, you, you, you're not going to make it today. Not, not like I'm going to die, but you're, okay, so you're not feeling good? Okay, yeah, get, eat some toast, put a little butter on it, have some Sprite, some 7-Up. But mom and dad would go on to church. I'm not talking about when I was five. I'm talking about a display. I'm when I could be home, 
a display of faithfulness. They didn't send a deacon over. They didn't send another, el- send another elder. They were the elders. Get the Crisco, anoint the head with oil, Father, in the name of Jesus. Brian lays here, I pray he's not faking, Lord. I pray that you would touch him, minister to his body. My parents pray that. I pray that you would raise him up off this bed. Now we're going to church. Something's crept in where we think that we no longer need to be faithful to the convictions of God. Not convicted because I know what I need to be doing, convicted that I live in the parameters and the boundaries of that conviction so I'm free. Now, I'm not, here's the deal. I am not saying I'm gonna judge you if you stay home with your husband or wife because they're sick. That's not what I'm saying. I'm giving you a model in my life that is true today. I remember several years ago, and I'm not trying to amp up my family, but I'm gonna preach on God's faithfulness because it was demonstrated in front of us. I can remember years ago, I was doing this uh, message called Master Craftsman, and we had borrowed from the area, Home Depot, Lowe's, all of these big tool chests, and I had these illustrated points that I were gonna use. It was on Father's Day, and it's Friday night, and I'm not feeling good. And Joy's like, hey, do you think I need to have something ready? I'm like, oh, no, I'll be fine by Sunday. Oh, she's learned. Uh, I'll be fine by Sunday. Saturday's rolling around. She's like, hey, if you're not feeling good, like by later afternoon, I I just need to be ready to preach. And I'm sitting here in my own pride, not feeling good, thinking you can't preach my message. (laughs) She printed out my message, went in our room, locked in. She said, I'm going to preach this tomorrow. And she preached the Father's Day message that the Lord had given me. And and here's the deal. It was one of those services that people are like, this was absolutely amazing and just what I needed. I'm laying on the bed. And I just got to be honest, I'm a baby when I'm sick. That's just me. Have you ever seen that little meme floating around? The, The wife standing over the husband. He's like laying on the couch, not feeling good. He's like, do you need anything? And he's like, I need chocolate. That's kind of me. Can you just like make me my favorite soup? Can you just, yeah, can you run and get me my favorite ice cream? Can you, that's me. I know, I know we got some really tough guys here. When I'm sick, I'm like, can you just serve me, please? What I'm saying is this. Are you a picture of faithfulness that you want your children to follow when they're 51? When they're 12? when they're 15, when they're 30? Are you a picture of faithfulness? We're serving the Lord. Yes, we were serving the Lord back here. We're gonna be serving the Lord right here. When you look at mom and dad, when they're 50, they're gonna be serving the Lord right here. We're gonna lay a pattern out in front of you. This is the way that scripture said to walk. So we're going to walk in that pattern and we're gonna trust the Lord. I love Acts 6, 8. Um, It's a very powerful scripture, but when we look at the life of the character and we look at his final days, it's not so, it's not one of those guys you're like, hey, let me be like that guy. You'll know it, Acts 6, 8. You'll know it when I say the first two words, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. He he was faithful. Stephen will also go down, like if he had a baseball card on the back of it, height, weight, this, that, and the other. How'd he die? First martyr. Just faithful. Faithfulness, being faithful to the work of God, not expecting everyone else to, being faithful, doing my part. I've learned this, the more I live, faithfulness is noticeable. Faithfulness is a conviction that we will hold to patterns of truth. We'll lock in on them. We'll laser in on them. I want to talk about the fruit of gentleness. The fruit of gentleness. I talked um, just a moment ago about gentleness, but I want to use the Greek word gentleness here. It, It means this. The fruit of gentleness means that there is a meekness to you. There is a meekness to you. You don't have to win every battle. There is a meekness to you. All of you have seen a meek father. He's wrestling with his toddler that is two or three years old. The kid's jumping off the couch doing pile drivers on dad. 
dad's not answering back the same way. I mean, he could put a thumb on his kid's chest and hold him down. But in his meekness, he just allows the war to go on and he looks at his little boy and says, you're so tough, son. Right? It's, 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 a, it's a controlled strength. There's a mildness, a, a mildness to men and women in the church because they have the fruit of the Spirit. James 1.21, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to do what? Which is able to save your souls. Man, as I was reading through this this morning, I, I began to think James one twenty one says with meekness, uh, the implanted word, receive it, that is able to save your souls. I, I see this in the church and outside of the church. So many people are reaching for things that will not save them. Striving for stuff that will not save them. It has no eternal merit or value on their life, but we chase it and we go after it and we go after it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going after some things if that's what the Lord said to do. I'm walking in the pre-planned steps that a trained soldier walks in. So many, and I see this, I see this in different platforms in different ways, but I see this so many times in the, in the world of sports. You'll see a young man who has been given more money than he, or he's been given more money than all of us in this room combined would know how to manage and know what to do with. And all of a sudden, you'll see weeks later, months later, he took that $280,000 car and ran it right into a telephone pole. And he's gone. Just striving and reaching for things. And I look at this striving in the world. You'll see it in the area of music, striving to this, one up this. I got to be seen over this person because this will get me that contract and that contract. Here's the problem with that. It's, it's the challenge of when that worldly striving begins to creep into the church and we begin to live by the same pattern. I don't know when it skipped. Turn your eyes towards Jesus. Look, look, look forth in his wonderful face. And the, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Some of us are like, I don't like that. And I got to be honest with you. Sometimes it's hard to like in your 20s. Sometimes it's hard to like in your 30s because you have so much life in front of you. But can some of the older saints in the church testify that the older you get, the more you really see what's important and even vital and priority in your life. What would it profit if my son or daughter were the most well-known person as I live or for the next 50 years? What would happen if they gain the, the attention of the whole world and lose their very own soul? that the word of God would be planted in our hearts and it's necessary to the believer that there would be a mildness and a humility to us. And then I believe this is the ninth and final one. It's the, the fruit of self-control. And self-control, this is the easiest analogy that worked for me. So when I saw temperance, this analogy jumped. And so self-control, the word means temperance, Greek word, and it means to master desires and passions. Who's ever had a desire or, pa or passion that was out of control, right? We all have. But self-control means that there's temperance. Proverbs 25, 28, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls, right? So here's the analogy. 
standard glass. Those windows in the back would be standard glass. If I take a baseball and I would throw it through it, it would shatter fragmented pieces. I go out to your windshield and I throw a baseball. It, it would kind of depend on how it hit, where it hit. But if it hit and it broke it, it would, it would, it's almost like the glass pixelates little bitty fragments around it. But you're not going to be see these big splinters. Why? Because the glass has been tempered, right? Some of our, some of our individuals, first responders, would completely understand this because they've seen a lot of it. Standard glass is not as strong, and it also takes less time to make. Tempered glass is stronger, and it takes longer to make. How many of you want to be tempered in your life with Christ, the fruit of the Spirit operate in you, operating fully in you, the, the process taking some time? So I want us to remember today, I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time on that. I want, to remember, want us to remember the plurality of works of the flesh because you and I have had many works of the flesh, plural, this working and this at work and this at work. But I want us to realize and think about the sweetness that we can find in one fruit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. This is how we understand and know that we've been filled with the spirit of Christ, filled with the spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As such, there is no law. I want you to imagine this morning, if you will, a piece of fruit. Okay, everybody see this? Piece of fruit that when you bite into it, I'm not going to because this one needs to be peeled. Matter of fact, if, if I peeled this and bit into this one, it would be bitter because it's a grapefruit, but it's what we could find quickly today. So track with me. This is heaven's fruit that you're looking at. Imagine this. A piece of fruit that you bit into that had nine distinct qualities working in it. I'm doing my best to make this a parable. I don't know what your favorite fruits are, but imagine biting into fruit that had the taste of mango, the taste of strawberry, the taste of banana, the, the, the citrus taste of an orange, all in one bite, all in one fruit. For those who are filled with the Spirit, don't get attracted to the gift. Power, power, here, here. No, watch. If you're filled with the Spirit, you have one fruit of the Spirit operating in nine qualities. So filled with the Spirit, people, They suffer long. Filled with the spirit people have these nine attributes that are are working in them. Filled, Filled with the spirit people, you could see it in the checkout line. They're kind. Filled with the spirit people have goodness working in them. They're faithful. They're gentle. There's signs of meekness all over them. They have love. They have joy. So many times when it comes to the spirit, we look at, I've got to do all of these things so that the Lord would give me all of these things. These nine things are not yours. These nine things come through the spirit filling you. A spirit-filled life will be noticeable first in fruit before the demonstration of power. I can check it. They can preach up a storm. Okay, do they have fruit? They can lead up a room. Okay, do they have fruit? They prayed for me in this house. Okay, 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 okay. 
I get it. We're in the gifts right now. But the fruit is as equal to the gift. You didn't have to do backflips for it. You didn't beg for it. The Holy Spirit came. You've got the spirit of baptism in the spirit, speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit came and he gave you that gift. You're filled with the spirit. Love it. You've got nine attributes working in your life through one fruit. How many of you are ready to go out and just practice the fruit of the spirit this week? So that when you're sitting there today and your steak comes well done, you don't have to look at the person who's working real hard to say, well done, who eats a steak? Well done. I ordered it medium rare. It's amazing how our Christianity is tested just at the restaurant. It's amazing that not as a pastor, as a believer in Jesus Christ, it's amazing what I can see in your life and you can see in my life simply from looking at the fruit. It's not the fire. It's not the attraction. It's the sweetness of what the Spirit does when he fills an individual up. Who would say this week we might need the Holy Spirit's help? If that's you all over this room, would you stand with me? You're just saying, Holy Spirit, I need you. I want to walk this distinct path. I want to pray for you this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, I'm thankful for you today, and I'm thankful for your work. I'm thankful that five weeks in that we are looking at the fruit of the Spirit, the sweetness in one fruit, nine attributes. I'm thankful that today I don't get to pick one and parcel the rest of them out. Spirit-filled life will have all of them. So I am asking you today, by your sweetness and by your gentleness and by your help, Highlight the ones that we have personally been struggling with. Out of the nine, let them pop off the page. And Father, I pray that we would be diligent to open our hearts up and say, Holy Spirit, work in us. So we're thankful that you've given us these nine qualities. We're thankful that you've filled us with the Spirit And now we're praying that you would help us daily walk out the distinct path. Because Christ has ordered that way. Lord, I pray your blessings upon us today. Not so that we would continue to move forward in the things that we would move forward in. If that's the case in the way that you want to bless, bless that way. But if there's also things that you want to take away, I pray that we would surrender ourselves to you and yield ourselves to you. I ask, Lord, over this next week, Sunday to Sunday, that we would think through Galatians chapter 5 and that you would help us to live by the fruit of the Spirit. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said this morning, amen.